Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one is called The Re-Establishment of the Holy Roman Empire and deals with Chapter 4 of the book Behind the Dictators by Her Leo Herbert Lehman, written in 1942. I think this is a very interesting book. I have to repeat this a little bit because not everybody watches all parts. Because you know that I was quite a little bit attacked when I read, when I read Rulers of Evil last year. Some people, uh, accusing me of bashing Americans. I can't help it that Tupper Saucy wrote a history on American, a book on American history. <laughs> That's just the fact that I was reading that. But anyway, this book, Behind the Dictators, most of the part deals with Europe's history and the history of Europe during and before the Second World War, which is actually a continuation of the First World War, as most of my listeners know already, because Marshal Fock, who was the leader of the Entente, the Allied troops in the First World War, said so in 19, 1918 in Versailles, that this is not a peace treaty in Versailles, but just a 20-year truth. He said that in 1919 and in 1939 there was the outbreak of the Second World War. So, make up your own mind what you think of that. Marshal Fock, of course, was, was a Jesuit-controlled Knight of Malta. Anyway, today for the reading, the re-establishment of the Holy Roman Empire, I asked my Christian friend over there in the United States of America and Minnesota, Brett Norman, to join me because sometimes it's interesting to do a reading and here and there hear of the thoughts that somebody else has at the same moment. So, welcome, Brett, to the broadcast, I would always say, but just to the recording of our reading together of Chapter 4, Behind the Dictators. And um, a very good morning to you, because it's only a few minutes past eight there. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm very blessed to be here and I'm looking forward to the reading of this chapter. Yeah, me too, because it deals, as I said already, with uh, European history. So now then the people can accuse me of bashing Europeans after they <laughs> accuse me of bashing Americans, eh? <laughs> yes. Well, I have to tell you, I'm not bashing Europeans or Americans either. I'm bashing the Roman Catholic Church with all my power that the Holy Spirit gives to me because that's the real culprit behind it. As we have already learned in the first three chapters of this book, and uh, I hope that all your listener, all my listeners enjoyed the last chapter, The Strange Case of Leo Texel, which almost took an hour in recording and was quite interesting in the lie that was spun in there about Albert Pike. But anyway, now I'm going to start reading chapter 4, The Re-Establishment of the Holy Roman Empire. So that means that there must have been a Roman Empire before. That is probably what is known as the Dark Ages between 538 and uh, 1798. The Holy Roman Empire of Germination, which was from 800 and a few years until 1800, the end of the Napole Napoleonic Wars, a thousand-year Reich that was ruled by the emperors of Germany through the Pope in Rome of course, and now we are speaking about the re-establishment of the Holy Roman Empire. The reading starts on page 20 in the PDF, if you follow along, as follows. Europe's tragedy and Catholic opinion, Roman Catholic opinion, is due to the breaking of its great papal-controlled confederation of states by the Protestant Reformation. All the efforts of the Roman Catholic Church since have been directed to the work of counter-reformation, to re-establish the political and social order of pre-reformation times. And that's already the moment where I have to start for a first little comment here. All the efforts of the Catholic Church since the Protestant Reformation have been directed to work of counter-reformation. Their greatest work started with, in 1540, the approval of Antichrist, Pope Leo III's approval of the Society of Jesus, the so-called Jesuits, founded by Ignatius of Loyola at that time. And two years later, as we read in Rulers of Evil, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, were agreeing on the terms of taking over the Inquisition from the Dominicans. 
And another three years later, in 14, 1545, the Roman Catholic Church, through the Jesuits, started what is today called as the Council of Trent. That took time, about 18 years, running in different sessions between 1545 and 1563, and that was counter-reformation, that was to work against everything Luther, Calvin, Tyndale, Wycliffe, Cranmer, Mortimer, Zwingli, and all the other fantastic reformers had achieved up to that time, bringing light into the dark world where there was no light because the word of God was not known to the people who were ruled by tyrants as actually they are today. Maybe you have an additional comment here, Brett? Sure, yeah, I was thinking along the lines of the reestablishment of the political and social order of pre-Reformation times. It it just, mm, I just think of, you know, uh, that comment uh, that uh, Walt was making about the uh, America's, um, you know, I'm sorry. I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. Mm. It is morning. <laughs> Got to have more coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, it's funny. I was reading this last night and it was just going boom, 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 boom. And now I'm just like stumped. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But, uh, yeah, I was just thinking along the lines of, of, uh, 1776 Counter Reformation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> being America here and uh the the Jesuits going underground in uh the creation of of this country and George Washington being part of that and and the big controversy over researchers uh you know hinging right on George Washington was he uh Jesuit in, influenced or not you know that type of discussion and, uh, and to my research, I just it just stands out like a sore thumb that uh, that George Washington was definitely influenced and a part of this. Sure, and I think sure, and I think one of the biggest proofs that you can mention for that is the apotheosis that you have on the ceiling of the Capitol with the deification That's... of George Washington there. There you go. You, you just have to look up there, and you just have to look up. Uh, the different chapters laid in the book of Rulers of Evil that all deal with uh, the erection of the capital and the erection of the so-called quote-unquote freedom figure um, that is on the top of the capital facing east, um, the erection of the White House, which comes originally from Jesuit father Andrew White, um, the... Uh, the second largest obelisk in the world that is in Washington, D.C., facing the east. Ronald Reagan, when he was ordained a president as the first American president, was facing the obelisk when taking his vows as, um, uh, as American president, which was, as we all know, a secret sign to the Jesuits and uh, the Roman Catholics who were in the know that now the United States of America are completely controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. And you just have to go back to chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil, Subliminal Rome, to understand that and read the names all therein, uh, how all these Catholic laymen and Catholic um, politicians were in function of all the different uh, of all the different uh, policies in the United States, from agriculture, from banking system, from health system, and all that stuff. I mean, just go mm -hmm. back to Rulers of Evil, read Chapter One, and if you can refute Chapter One of Rulers of Evil, then you don't have to read the book at all. But the problem is that you probably can't because it's also very well documented. 
But anyway, I think I'm going to continue reading because after every ten, sense when we, uh, sentence when we do 10 minutes of, uh, <laughs> of, of commenting, it will take us two days to go through these few pages. <laughs> anyway, is there anything else that you wanted to say or is it okay? That's, that I continue? that's perfectly good. Thank you. Okay, then I will continue. That order of states was hierarchical, not democratic, and was ruled at the top by the dual sovereignty of Pope and Emperor by the Union of Church-State Authority, as I mentioned already in the introduction of the thousand-year Reich, Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. The political and social order that resulted from the Reformation, both in Europe and America, so you see there is a comparison that they both are quite the same, mm -hmm. is regarded by the Catholic Church as pagan and anti-Christian. They give it the name of pseudo-democracy. Yeah, of course they call it anti-Christian, but of course my listeners know that the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. So, this, what comes out of the Reformation, is actually not anti-Christian, it is anti-Roman Catholic. That is what you have to understand when reading sentences like these. This is to be found in all official Catholic writings and is the burden of all papal encyclicals. Well, just read the syllabus of errors from Pio Nono, Antichrist Pope Pius IX from 1864, to learn what the Roman Catholic Church thinks of government of the people, for the people, by the people, based on the law of God, the Creator. The Jesuit Weekly America, which is a magazine, the most famous Jesuit uh, magazine in the United States of America, for instance, tells us that the evils of our present time are to be ascribed to this pseudo-democracy, which is pagan in its remote origins and leads to an inhuman wage system, an uprooted proletariat and pauperism. Unquote. It goes further to say, quote, Protestant, rationalist and now definitely anti-Christian in its inspiration, its logical fruit is socialism and calls for a return to an integral social order, the principles of which are still preserved in our languid memory of the great medieval experiment, unquote. Yeah, to call the Dark Ages a great medieval experiment... I don't know what to think about that. It was the rule of Satan, you can actually say, who was at that time not even known by the people because when they entered the church, they thought they entered the church of Christ, which was, of course, Babylon. That's why God wrote in Revelation 18, verse 4, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. Now few realize how intense is the hatred of the, of the official Roman Catholic spokesman for the American democratic way of life. This same Jesuit magazine, America, which advertises itself as, quote, the most influential Catholic magazine in the United States, unquote, published the following on, in its issue of May 17, 1941, just six months before Pearl Harbor. Quote, How we Catholics have loathed and despised this Lucifer civilization, this rationalist creation of those little men who refuse to bend the knee or bow the head in submission to higher authority. Today, American Catholics are being asked to shed their blood for that particular kind of secularist civilization which they have been her uh, heroically repudiating for four centuries. This civilization is now called democracy, and the suggestion is being made that we send the Yanks to Europe again to defend it. In reality, is it worth defending? What's the sum and substance of it all? All the Yanks in America will, do, will not save it from disintegration. Unless a miracle occurs, it is doomed, finally and irrevocably doomed, the new order in Europe will be either a Nazi or a British totalitarianism, or 
a combination of both. American democracy is disintegrating, crumbling from within. Fatigue, disillusionment, disgust, the unbearable tension in society, the fear of war and the fear of bankruptcy, the absence of security, the technological revolution which has gone far beyond the instruments of social control, deep-rooted anarchistic hatred of a social order which has too long denied the principle of social justice, the revolt of the masses, and the leveling of all values, the absence of any common ethical basis, these are but a few of the multiple factors in the decline which is now upon us. Leadership in this crisis will not come from the laity. It will not come from the bottom of the Catholic pyramid. It will come only from the top, from the hierarchy. The Christian revolution will begin when we decide to cut loose from the existing social order, rather than be buried with it. End quote. Now, what I've just read actually calls for not one comment, but I think almost an hour-long comment. <laughs> what yeah. they all put in this little mm. article in the Jesuit magazine here already. I mean, just take the last sentence. The Christian revolution will begin when we decide to cut loose from the existing social order, rather than be buried with it. Huh? Leadership in this crisis will not come from the laity, it will not come from the bottom of the Catholic pyramid, it will come only from the top, from the hierarchy. This reminds me of the videos that I made some time ago under the name of Nothing But The Truth, the externalization of the hierarchy, where we were speaking about the ten satanic commandments coming out of the United Nations published by Lucis Trust, formerly known as Lucifer's Trust. You see how all these things always come back together again? Saying in, this, uh, in the last but one paragraph what I just read, American democracy is disintegrating. What do we have today? I mean, this book was written 1942, people. We are 74 years later, and it is absolutely to the moment, on sp spot on. Isn't it, Brett? Absolutely. You got some comments true. here? Come on. Oh, no. I just... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I see this new order right away in here, and I think of the NIV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where they, they uh, changed... Uh, oh, I forget what, uh, what verse that is. Is that in Revelation or something? 21? I forget. I tried to look that up here this morning, and... Uh, I apologize for not getting that down, but, um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is the, uh, the Jesuit mouth, mouthpiece speaking here, and, um, it's just filled with casuistry all over the place here. How we Catholics have loathed and despised this Lucifer civilization. What Lucifer civilization? <laughs> what is it? They're referring to their, uh, to the, they're trying to, they're trying to pin Lucifer on the Protestants, basically, aren't they here? Sure. Yeah, of course, because it's convenient and. You know. Everything is heretic and satanic that is not Roman Catholic. Right. They just twist everything and put it right back on the backs of the good people that are trying to do, uh, uh, you know, a. Uh, uh, righteous work you know they <laughs> they despise it because their righteousness is our uh transgression so it's just you know this is what we're living with we're living in a in a uh very confusing situation politically and and this this work right here really starts to open that up and uh it's difficult to uh to get a grasp on this without referring back to the Word of God, you know? And we really need to be backed up with Christ and His Word before we can approach this, almost, you know? Absolutely. And uh, so that's kind of where I get a little hung up, to be honest. You know, at times I'll just get thrown for a loop for a while, and i got to take a break and come back. <laughs> and then, and then it, it becomes more clear, you know, that 
the more you you digest the deception and the outright lies <laughs> lie after lie after lie yeah just going back to the last but one paragraph where it reads uh, american democracy is disintegrating crumbling from within fatigue disillusionment disgust the unbearable tension in society, the fear of war and the fear of bankruptcy, the absence of security. Written in 1942, don't you see how that is transferable absolutely into our time, 2016 today? The fear of war, the fear of bankruptcy, the absence of security, where you have an America to give up all your freedoms for security, And wasn't there an American president who said that when you give up um, your freedoms for security, you will lose both? Mm -hmm. The technical revolution, which has gone far beyond the instruments of social control. Well, what do we have today? Social control through social media, iPhones, iPads, Google+, Facebook, Twitter. All these social media, this social control that we are talking today of, that has already been, been identified by them in this magazine in 1942, 74 years before today. And you can see how actually nothing has changed, right? Right. Okay, when there's no more comment from you, I will continue the reading, Brad. Please continue. Whatever opinion the Catholic Church may now express about Hitler and his Nazi socialism, it stands 100% with him and the other fascist dictators in, in this avowed objective of destroying the political and social order that came out of the Reformation and substituting therefore an integral, positive Christian hierarchical confederation of states, similar to that which existed before Protestantism disrupted the authoritarian order of things in Central Europe. Well, this sentence you have, of course, to change positive Christian hierarchical confederation of state. Um, you have to read Christian always as a Roman Catholic, you know, a positive Roman Catholic hierarchical confederation of states, similar to that which existed before the Protestant Europe. Hitler laid it down in Article 24 of his National Social Party program that, quote, the party as such starts from the standpoint of a positive Christianity, unquote. Read Roman Catholicism. This is specifically a Jesuit principle of action with the ultimate objective of inducing all Christian sects to unite with the Roman Catholic Church for a Christian reform of states, the establishment of an hierarchical grouping of cooperative states entirely devoid of Jewish, Masonic and Protestant influence. Bishop Hudal and other German prelates have pointed out the identity of the fundamentals of National Socialism and Catholicism. Father Coughlin, who you know from earlier chapters reading me in this book, and his Jesuit supporters preach the same in this country, the United States of America. To date, 1942, Hitler's blitzkriegs are accomplishing in fact everything set forth in his ideological concepts for a new order in all of Europe after his ruthless extermination of Judaism and Masonry. For centuries, Vatican policy has based all its hopes for the restoration of its dominion over the nations of Europe upon a strong, militaristic Germany that would cleanse the continent of all British Protestant influence from the West and, above all, safeguard it from Russo-Slavic invasion from the East. A greater Germany, in other words, must be made again the center of a revived Holy Roman Empire. A revived Holy Roman Empire. And I will comment on that a little bit later, because that's exactly what we have with the European Union today. It is significant, significant that Pope Leo XIII urged this very plan upon the late Kaiser Wilhelm II during the latter's last visit to the Vatican. 
The Kaiser, in his memoirs, vividly describes the colorful and solemn setting in which the interview took place, and says that he jotted down what was said for future reference. What interested him most was Pope Leo's insistence that, by war, if necessary, the Holy Roman Empire should be restored, and that to this end, quote, Germany must become the sword of the Catholic Church, unquote. Very, very interesting what I've just read here. What interested him most was Pope Leo's insistence that by war, if necessary, the Holy Roman Empire should be restored. What do they have the Jesuit order for? The church at war. The church at war, according to Roman Catholic own writings, is more useful than the church in peacetime. Because only war will take care of that the hands on the scale of the grandfather clock will advance the Roman Catholic agenda when the pendulum swings from the left to the right and the right back to the left. Now following are the Kaiser's own words. You have to understand that was before 1918. Quote, it was of interest to me that the Pope said to me on this occasion that Germany must become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. I remarked that the old Roman Empire of the German nation no longer existed, and that conditions had changed. But he stuck to his words. Unquote. Hitler succeeded the Kaiser with the interruption of the Weimar Republic, which was just a puppet democracy. And by Germany's military might wiped out from all of Europe popular government, Freemasonry, and all the democratic freedoms against which Pope Leo XIII and other 19th century popes fulminated their condemnations. Condemnations? Well, again, read Pope Pius IX and his syllabus of error of 1864. Catholic propagandists in the United States of America, despite expressed opinions to the contrary, have not been unaware of this identity of interests between Nazi fascism and Catholic aims, and dip diplomatically, but definitely, have been striving for their realization. Hitler's early conquests in Austria and Czechoslovakia were applauded as, quote, a natural readjustment in Europe, unquote, by the Catholic Justice Herbert O'Brien from New York in an article featured in the New York Herald Tribune of March 29, 1938. Needless to say, his opinions are not solely his own, but were obviously dictated to him by official Roman Catholic authority. Read the Jesuits. Taking occasion to warn the United States from participating in war on the side of England and France, Justice O'Brien stated that such a war would be unjust, since its objective would be, quote, to oppose certain political adjustments and changes in Central Europe resulting in economic and nationalistic confederations, which had existed for generations before the great world conflict and also to resist that great confederation of small groups which, up to the breaking out of the Great World War, had enjoyed under the beneficent sway of the Habsburgs commercial prosperity, independence and peace. Now, I have to comment here a little bit, but um, Brett, you're so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> no, no comment on anything here before I go into my comment? Ah, uh, you know, I uh, I did read through this, and you know, I uh, happy to be here, but you know, it is uh, still a bit over my head, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you. And it's fine. I I just I'll hang in there, and I will make some comments, but I, I, okay. I it is a little bit uh, a little up there. <laughs> okay, it really is. I really enjoy listening. So, what comment do I have to make here on this independence and peace? Here you have to understand the Jesuit doctrine coming from the art of war, a book attributed to the Jesuits when you followed my reading of Rulers of Evil from Sun Tzu. One of the main rules of Sun Tzu was, quote, appear weak when you are strong, 
and strong when you are weak. So Germany was weakened through this unjust war, the First World War, and appeared destroyed and weak also in the Second World War. Now, through the Marshall Plan, and being a founding nation of the EU, the, at that time it wasn't called the European Union as it was called today, but it was called, uh, I, I don't know, I, I even forgot the words about it, but it started as a trading, uh, as, uh, as a trading, uh, how do you call that, um, company I just wanted to say, <laughs> but they just founded the EU market uh, in, in the 50s and uh, Germany was of course one of the uh, founding nations of those. So through the Marshall Plan and being a founding nation of the EU, it regained strength and is today in 2016 the strongest country in the European Union economically and financially, though hopelessly in debt as is the United States of America. Completely controlled by the Vatican, the words of Antichrist Leo XIII come into fruition a century later here. Now, he goes on to say, this is still uh, O'Brien, quote, The opposition to this adjustment of the German peoples with some of the groups of the old Austrian Empire, where come the Habsburgs from, comes from England and France. These two nations have expressed their bitter resentment over these changes as a disturbance of the balance of power in Europe and are fearful that Germany, in union with the reunited Austria, will place the German peoples in the ascendancy with ample force to maintain this position and, by alliance with Italy, terminate Britain's sole supremacy of the Mediterranean and directly affect its sole future control of India, and Egypt and the African British colonies. Unquote. He wrote that quote, dismemberment of the Austrian Empire was the most tragic blunder of the twentieth century. When England and France chopped up Austria, they ruined Europe. Unquote. He applauded Hitler's success in destroying Protestant British hegemony in Central Europe and in securing a return to the political and social setup of the corporate union of states in a revived Holy Roman Confederation. Quote, what America is witnessing is the normal reunion of these several parts into the original living structure. It had to come. It could not be blocked. In justice to the 100 million people in Central Europe, why should anyone try to prevent it? Unquote. He uncovered the whole pretense of official Catholic opposition, even to Hitler's religious and racial persecutions, as well as to his protectorates over non-German nations as follows. Quote, it happened with Hitler. It would have happened without Hitler and in spite of Hitler. And with the inclusion of these non-Germanic groups, Hitler's anti-religious and racial persecutions must terminate and vanish. Hitler will pass away, but the great re-established union together with religious liberties will survive. Unquote. Now this is an admission of the European Union today. The revived Holy Roman Empire from before the Reformation under German leadership. Remember, this is from the Roman Catholic Justice, Herbert O'Brien. Continuing on page 24. What the Catholic Church is hoping and working for as a result of the present death struggle between the fascist and democratic blocs is the re-establishment in Europe of the real state, a rigid hierarchical system wherein inferiors are subject to superiors. In this system, each individual, like a cell in a body, must humbly submit to his fate and occupy his natural place, which is allotted to him from birth and have no desire to get away from it. This basis of social structure is not only anti-Jewish, but also anti-Protestant. It corresponds exactly to the system of the Jesuit order itself, as founded by Ignatius Loyola, the essential point of which consists in a hierarchical structure of ideas 
and is characteristic of all Catholic political thought. The hierarchical, as opposed to the Protestant democratic system, holds that the different races constitute the hierarchical steps in a cosmic system, which no one has the right to change or modify, either by individual or collective will. I will not disrupt my reading here now for a comment, because I will later read to you a comment that I prepared on just this point. The Jesuit father Muckermann, in his many works on race hygiene, fully explains this ideologically, uh, ideology, ideology, sorry, which is at the basis of all the aims and acts of Nazi fascism. Mixture of races, he holds, produces inharmonious descendants who have difficulty in allowing themselves to be absorbed into a national unity. National unity. Wow! What do you think now is the underlying agenda of the refugee situation today? National unity is dead. Long live the new world order under the supremacy of the Antichrist. It is well known that mixture of races bring f brings forth strong individualities, and these, in the Jesuit view, would disrupt the static harmony they desire among peoples and nations, as well as nullify the gregarious instinct which the Jesuits endeavor to foster. In their view, harmony is a state where each one places himself humbly and voluntarily in the organic niche appointed for him by the supreme authority without any diabolic, inharmonious desire to leave it. Now, here I'm going to make a comment. Because from rulers of evil we have learned, quote, from rulers of evil, every ruled society has some form of holy scripture. The holy scriptures of Caesarean Rome where the prophecies and ritual directions contained in the ten Sibylline Gospels and Virgil's Aeneid. The Aeneid implied that every Roman's duty, listen carefully, that every Roman's duty was to sacrifice his individuality, as heroic Aeneas had done, to the greater glory of Rome and Pontifex Maximus, unquote, from rulers of evil. Now, since through the civil law of the land, we are all made Catholics over there in the United States of America, and of course over here in Europe, meaning we are all made Romans, according to the papal bull Unam Sanctum of Antichrist Boniface VIII from 1302, this all is totally legit for the Roman Catholic Church. No individuality. Sacrifice yourself for the common good, as Antichrist Francis said so eloquently at least six times last year during his visit to the United States of America when he spoke before a joint session of Congress. He used at least six times the term the common good. Now you understand what he meant. This is the way the Jesuit order itself is built up, and this is the ideal Catholic aim for states and groups of states. What's the United States Others, other than a group of states? In the political and social order. It is the organic, static, hierarchical, integralist cooperative system of Nazi fascist teaching, which is already in effect in many countries of Europe. It is in direct opposition to the disintegralist, dynamic, liberal, free, democratic concept of political and social order. The Jesuit order has its Aryan paragraph corresponding exactly to that of Hitlerism. Its constitutions contain six impediments against reception into the order, the first of which is Jewish descent up to the fourth generation. If Jewish descent is discovered after a candidate's admission, it prevents his quote-unquote radiation, or you can also call it illumination. This Aryan paragraph first appeared in the Statutes of the Order in 1593. 
was confirmed in 1608 and is to be found in the latest official edition published in Florence in 1893. So that's about 50 years before this book was written. General councils of the order have many times proclaimed that Jewish descent must be considered as, quote, an impurity, scandal, dishonor, and infamy, unquote. Suarez, a noted Jesuit theologian, also states that Jewish descent is an impurity of such indelible character that it is sufficient to prevent admission into the order. And again, I cannot help to make a comment that will show you what is really meant. I'm just going to read to you one paragraph from the oath of induction a Jesuit takes when initiated into a position of commanding within the order. Quote, My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler. Among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic, and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man. Among the reformers, to be a reformer. Among the Huguenots, to be a Huguenot. Among the Calvinists, to be a Calvinist. Among other Protestants, generally, to be a Protestant. And obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews, that you might be unable to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. Unquote. Now, do you really think they even need an Aryan paragraph in their order? This identity of interests between Nazi fascism and Jesuit Catholicism in the matter of opposition to the mixture of races and religions is something that cannot be denied. And this ideology is the prime cause of the war that is devastating the world at the present time. Hitler, the fanatic, has already gone a long way to bring it to realization. If he succeeds in making it permanent, the new order which he has vowed to bring about in Europe, will be what the Catholic Church has been strenuously working for during the past four centuries. As a result, Europe will be entirely free of that pseudo-democratic liberalism so hateful to official Catholicism. With or without Hitler, as Justice Bryan says, it had to come and its beginnings could only have been accomplished by the ruthless war now being waged by Nazi fascism, a fact which its Jesuit proponents have fully realized during their centuries of counter-reformation activities. But it is only by facing this fact and forgetting Roman Catholic propaganda in our daily newspapers that we can understand why a victory for an authoritarian Germany, not its crushing defeat by the democratic allies, has been fervently desired by the Vatican. Remember my earlier comment on the building of the EU in the beginning of the quotes from Judge O'Brien? This is exactly what I was talking about and the goal of the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church from the start. They use either way. The end justifies the means. To reach their goal and the grandfather's clock only advances the agenda of the hand of the scale while you turn from left to right and right to left and back. It doesn't matter which way the Roman Catholic Church achieves its goal of a united Europe, of a new revived Holy Roman Empire, whether of the German nation or of no nation, but a revived Holy Roman Empire, what is actually the European Union the day of today? Whether they achieve it with war, and they could have achieved it if they have given, if they would have given Hitler all the power that he needed to win the war, then it would have been wartime. But, you know, that the Pope always has to come in and present himself 
as the maker of peace. And that is exactly what they have chosen. And they have chosen the German people in the Second World War to lose millions and millions and millions of their people during the war. And by that, they uh, reduced the Protestant part of the German population for a very, very great part. And then taking special American units in D-Day, I don't know if you are aware of that, but the units that came along the French coast on D-Day were especially chosen soldiers of America filled with Protestant soldiers, not Roman Catholics. Killing English Protestants during World War War, killing American Protestants during World War II, War II, killing German Protestants during World War II, and killing Russian Orthodox through World War II. And who is the gainer in the end? Well, now I leave a little comment to you, Brett, because I'm done. <laughs> well, yes, it's the the uh, reestablished Holy Roman Empire. Yes, it is, and that is a, uh, a devastating reality today. And uh, you know, when I first stumbled into some of this information, it just threw me for a loop, and uh, I just haven't come back yet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, still trying to get a grasp on it, but yes, it is awfully large and in charge. <laughs> very, very much so. And uh, what a fantastic document this is from 1942. Yeah, and I think that if you analyze it the right way, like I try to do during this reading, and you apply everything that I read here to the United States of America and the times that we are living in right now, you can see the similarities, can't you? You sure can. Yep, yeah. they just jump right out at you. And of course, uh, without taking anything away from the reading of the book later on in later chapters, but you know of the Vatican Red Lines, you know of Operation Paperclip, where they made sure that all the people that had success in Germany enforcing the Roman Catholic agenda there were imported into the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Helping founding, after the OSS, the CIA, the Catholics in action. Mm, you'll never hear that in your history lesson class there. <laughs> no. No, you got to do your own research for that. That's for sure. But wow, yeah, when you add that to the mix, it really starts to make sense what's going on in America. Very much so. Okay, then this ends the reading of Chapter 4 of um, the book Behind the Dictators from Lehman, The Reestablishment of the Holy Roman Empire. I thank you all for watching the video and listening, and I hope to see you back when we come to Chapter 5, Hitler and the Catholic Church, with the next reading. Until then, from me and from Brett over there in Minnesota in the United States, God bless you all and bye-bye. Well, you were awfully quiet. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I apologize. I should have had more to add to it, but I just, you know, I was just, wow, I'm just stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Deer in the headlights, Yark. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> oh, uh, it man. It was just like reading before a live audience instead of uh, with a co-commentator. So. No, it's all right. I, I, I don't mind at all coming on. It just, uh, it's just, uh, wow. I mean, it, you really need to have some ammunition stored up for this one. <laughs> it's major. 
That's why I always take time to prepare for each chapter to read in the book and to take my notes and prepare a lot of a few of the comments. There were a lot of the comments today that I even didn't prepare that I just put in there. Great. Came to me at the moment. But, That's great. That's but of really course, there were a few that I prepared also. Yes. Like no. quotes from Rulers of Evil and things like that. You cannot make that up at the moment. You know, my jaw just kind of dropped at uh, this, uh, what was it, page 24? Yeah. Uh, uh, having difficulty in allowing themselves to be absorbed into a national unity and the um, refugee situation or every society, yes, yes. Or, or, or that one from the I need. It was every Roman's duty to sacrifice his individuality as Aeneas did to the greater mm -hmm. glory of Rome and the Pontifex Maximus. Now, doesn't that have to do with that uh, poem, Coeptus? Uh, Anit Coeptus. Yeah. Anit Coeptus, thank Anit you. Coeptus, yes, yeah. yes, right. Well, there was also another, wait, no, was that page 25? Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going nowhere. <laughs> I just, uh, what was it talking about race mixing? Well, page 24. It was 24. Yeah, yeah. Jesuit Father Muckerman in many of his works on race hygiene fully explains this ideology, which is at the basis of all aims and acts of Nazi fascism. Mixture of races, he holds, produces inharmonious descendants who have difficulty in allowing themselves to be absorbed into a national unity. Mm -hmm. Then I made the comment, what do you think now is the underlying agenda of the refugee situation today? Mm -hmm. Because they have difficulty in allowing themselves to be absorbed into a national unity where all nations have to be destroyed for the one world order, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, right. So what do you do? You flood mm -hmm. the nations with refugees, so-called, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and you take away their national unity. You know, that's exactly right. And, you know, I was talking to my mother yesterday. She goes to a Lutheran church, right? Well, guess what's happening in her Lutheran church I have no in idea. Minneapolis? The Latin Americans, the Latinos are part of the congregation now, and all of them. So they have, uh, they're, they're definitely lick, mixing in the Latin Latino worship right in there with, with the, uh, with the uh, call it what it is, Brett. Yeah, Catholicism. Right? Absolutely, it is. It's Catholicism, and it's growing like it's like, the same. It's it's the same that happened in 321 when the mm. Roman Empire yes um, hit itself under the garments of Christianity. They flooded all the heathen into the. Church of Christ at that time. Ah, uh, yeah, very good observation. History yeah. just repeats itself, Brett. Oh, man, it's, yes, it, it it's, does. it's all the same. It sure is. Are you still recording? Yeah. Well, feel you know, free to share could, this. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Yeah. They, they couldn't, they couldn't um, conquer the Church of Christ. You know... In Revelation, and somewhere in, in the beginning books of Revelation, it talks about uh, the ten days of tribulation, which were the ten years between 303 and 313, just the time before Constantine came to power. Wow. And wow. because when they killed a hundred, a thousand stood up, and when they killed a thousand Christians, ten thousand stood up, they had to change their policy. That was infiltration. So they mixed the holy with the profane, Mm -hmm. and covered the Roman, the heathen Roman Empire under the garments of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the same thing they are doing today with the refugee situation. Wow. There's nothing new under the sun. No, no, that's for sure. But when you don't know, I mean, people mm -hmm. always say history repeats itself. But the people do not know history. Yeah. So how can they see that history repeats itself when they are not taught history anymore? Well, and then you stack history up along with a uh, 
uh, revival of Christian, uh, biblical Christianity and studying your Bible. And then you really pack a punch, man. Yeah. You really do. And that's the problem is we got some, you know, like my brother study, studies history all the time, but does he read his King James Bible? Does he know his King James Bible? I wish he did. I really, really do. You can only study real history on the basis of the Bible. Because when you just take the secular books that are in all the public schools and libraries today, you will mm -hmm. be taught the history that they teach, which is falsified history, which is history they have written the way they mean to teach history. That's you can right. only understand history when you have the Bible all along and when you put everything that is written in the Bible to the actual events that happened in the past that you can research. Well, you know, my brother did make a really interesting comment. When I talked to him last, he said that history is all based around ideology. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It does. It does. And, uh, yeah, that's why we need to study a lot of history from different angles all the time. Yeah. And it really helps to get a different viewpoint. Which brings us back to Tapa Saucy, right? Mm, yes. It sure does. What an amazing book that is. Yeah, I'm still so glad that I read that. Me too. Yep. <clears throat> Fantastic work. You know, we have to understand what he wrote on the pages 73 and 74 of Rulers of Evil. Quote, mm. most colleges today are turning out graduates who have studied little or no history. In 1914, 90% of America's elite colleges required history. In 1939 means one generation later. In 1964 means two generations later. More than 50% did. By 1996, the time that he finished the book Rulers of Evil, only one of the 50 best schools offered a required history course. The day is approaching, perhaps, when the only historians will be amateurs who study history as self-help, who examine the past in order to make sense of the present and not to be caught unprepared by the future, unquote. And therefore, you have to take your Bible along with it, because otherwise you will never understand history. I just got it open here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. America's understanding has been systematically bent to the will of the church militant, while the intellectual means for sensing the capture have been disconnected. Most of the content, excuse me, content of modern media, whether television, radio, print, film, stage, or web, is state of the art Jesuit Ratio Studio. Studio and we have to understand for that <laughs> that the Roman Catholic Church says in Intermirifica it is her inerrant right to use mm -hmm. and possess all of these media radio, television, movies, press, social media as we know it today because Intermirifica comes from 19... 60 something, 63 or something, uh, I don't know. It's based on Miranda Prosus, which came out 1957 under Pope Pius XII, Hitler's Pope. Oh. And then, uh, Pope, uh, was it John the 23rd, who started uh, the ecumenical movement in Vatican II? You got it. Published Intermirifica, where that is stated in there. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing else than a confirmation of what you've just read. Mm -hmm. That's right. You have to understand Miranda Prosus and Intermirifica. And I always tell the listeners of my videos to look these up. You can look that up in the Catholic Encyclopedia. You can look that up on their own publications. It's their own papers. It's uh, papal encyclicals. Mm-hmm. You can look it up and read it, and there it states that it is the inerrant right of the Roman Catholic Church to own all these media. And that they do. Yeah, not only the 
so-called mass media, but they control also most of the so-called alternative media. People, awfully, cl awfully people clever, like, aren't they? <laughs> people like people like Alex Jones, David Icke, Max Jordan. I don't know all yeah. these guys. All these guys out there. Uh, YouTube channels like Dabu Seven and uh, or Seventy Seven or whatever his name is. Mm -hmm. All these guys who always ask for donation, who always ask for donations, they are all controlled opposition. They are all controlled alternative media. Because you never hear them speak the truth about the Antichrist, do you? Nope. Not once. Not once. You know, if they do bring up Antichrist, it's always the future one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Man. Yeah, it's all about the bucks to some. Almost all of them, actually. Mm -hmm. Really is. Well, it was an interesting reading, so tonight I have to do something else to work it into the video. <laughs> All right. Is it night there already? Or? No, it's uh, a few minutes past four in the afternoon now. Oh, that's right. We met at three. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a little earlier today. That's good, though. That's good. We didn't take that long. No, it didn't. It went fast. <laughs>